Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my 28 minute slot every Friday. Good to be back. Good to see you. Um, My show is about mental health, um, about my experiences over the decades and my battles with mental health, but more importantly it's about communicating with other people not just the struggles I've been through but my ideas uh, about what to do how to help people and getting involved in things and that's what it's really all about this is about getting involved uh, and helping people because uh, there are only two directions in this world that you will ever go forwards and backwards and If you think that there is some benevolent, loving philanthropist who's going to bail us all out or or some clap hands of government or or a change of attitude of the institutions, I can absolutely assure you that is never, never, never going to happen. And the reason for that is because all of those are only interested in one single thing, and that is maintaining the status quo. It's their sole purpose. Because by maintaining the status quo, they continue to profit off you at your cost. That's what they do. It's what they've always done. It's what they always will do. Change, real change, comes from ordinary individuals, from human beings, from people. And that is true throughout history. Yes, there are individuals who cause trouble, but in the end, the people who solve it are just that, ordinary people, like you and me. When their backs are against the wall, 99.9% of them will just die like dogs in the gutter. But one, every now and then, will stand up. And people will listen to what they have to say and think, you know, it's right. And they will get behind that person, or more importantly, that idea, and make change, huge change to their societies. There was a time when my ancestors were slaves. All of our ancestors were. They were called serfs and they worked on the land but they were never allowed to own anything. No property, no money, no no animals, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they existed like that for thousands of years. And over time we have slowly but surely emancipated ourselves. But it has taken an enormous amount of time and a long, slow struggle with a lot of fights, a lot of wars in between. But people did that. People made the change. And that is what I want to emphasise to you today. And I assure you that if you do nothing, then you will go backwards. If you choose to do something, anything at all, then your world will begin to change. That is how it changes. And what I like to encourage people to do is to think a little bit about how they want to be treated and treat others accordingly with common courtesy. Simple things like saying please and thank you, which cost you absolutely nothing to do. Just the other day I was in the bakery and the lady in there knows me. I just get a steak pie, simple, but a bing, but a boom and I'm out of there. So she said to me, steak pie is it and I said no 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 this lady to my right was here before me and I knew that she would muck around but I did the right thing because she was there first I didn't push it in front of her I said this lady was before me serve her first please now all she had to do was acknowledge me in any way say thank you nod would have cost her nothing but she didn't She just took her staff and turned around like I didn't exist and I thought, therein lies the problem. What would it have cost you to say thank you? You're not not trying to chat me up, you're just acknowledging me as a human being, just saying thank you for your kindness, for your 
care and consideration, for your recognition that I am a human being and I have rights just like everyone else. And that, that is the important thing. And that is how we change this world. Now, I'm not going to stop being polite just because of one asshole who didn't say thank you. That happens. People are like that. But bit by bit, people can change if you persist. The same thing goes for people suffering with mental health. Show them a little kindness, a little care, a little consideration that you would like to have shown to you. And boy, oh boy, what a different world this will be. That's where real change happens. In communities, in small towns like ours, in little places like the Wairapa, if we are kind and considerate and we care and we're polite and we're fair and decent people, we like to think we are. We love to think that we live in an egalitarian society where there is no racism and all people are treated equally, but that, that is a lie. So we need to change that and we especially need to change the attitude towards mental illness. It is starting to happen and it has become the flavour of the month now. You know, everyone's on the bandwagon. Whereas people like me and people who have helped me like Michael and Veronica have been at the cold face, unpaid, costing us money. And I've been doing it for years and years and years. And I'll continue to do it long after it's no longer popular. And I'll keep trying, no matter what. And I just hope that some people come on board, listen to what I say, have a little think about it and think, yeah, there is something that I can do to make this place better. And from there the groundswell happens. And who wouldn't want to live in a community of people who actually care about you and are polite and at least to some degree generous? What a different world it would be. What a happier place. And you have the ability to make that happen. You, your friends, your family. So have a good think about that. Well, time's ticking on as it always does. I just want to say a special thanks to all of our sponsors who sponsor these shows. Thank you all very much for your support. It is very welcome and very much appreciated. We all appreciate that. Thank you to Y Rapper TV for coming on board and spreading the good word and a special thanks to Michael and Veronica who have been my supporters for many many years um my rock really you know without them I would just be another voice in the wilderness and um you know they empower people who are in minorities who would not otherwise have a voice so I mean, what a great thing to do what a great job to have uh, making a difference you know that is something to be admired so thank you very much uh, to Michael and Veronica all right we better get on with today's story I love reading these stories to you and one day some sunny day um, I'm going to publish them on a book and when I do I'll let you know and I hope you buy that book and make me a fortune and uh, I'll do some good with it the story today is called The Kalahari and the Chobe River. Four of us struck out north from Pretoria, South Africa. We headed to the thirsty land of the Kalahari. Seedy, Wayne, Dave and myself had bought a car in Johannesburg and were driving up to the Chobe River on the far side of the Kalahari Desert. We planned to drive the length of the Kalahari to one of the three great river systems of the north. Our aim was the Chobe National Game Park in Botswana. Our first day's drive from Pretoria was a mixture of acceleration and trepidation. At first there was the reassurance of farms and horticulture made possible with irrigation. South Africa, for all of its shortcomings, still had well-organised systems in place which made life possible in tremendous heat. When the Dutch first crossed this place, they named them the Thirsty Lands. Driving over the border from South Africa to southern Botswana was like day to night. Suddenly the desert proper began looking reminiscent to the Australian outback. A large straight motorway led us into sandy, rather barren land that had not seen rain or water in a long time. Occasionally the motorway opened out and doubled up as a landing strip for planes. 
there was very little game around as a result of little foliage. Little, the little we saw in our travels looked half starved. We planned to spend as little time as possible in the southern parched lands and head for the promise the northern rivers provided. There are three great river systems in the north, the Okavango, which starts in the Angolan Heights and floods erratically through northern Botswana. Secondly, the Kuando River starts in Namibia and again erratically floods marshlands until it becomes the Chobe River system in Botswana. The Chobe then meets the mighty Zambezi, which flows down from Zambia, and they become the amazing Victoria Falls on the Zambia-Zimbabwe border. We were heading to the Middle River system, where it turns into the Chobe River in a well-established national park. It boasts some of the greatest concentrations of game anywhere in Africa. The water and grasslands attract hundreds of thousands of wildebeest and zebra, along with gazelles, kudu and impala, and giraffe and so on. They in turn attract lions, leopards, cheetahs and hyena. The most impressive of all, however, are the tens of thousands of elephants this good grazing attracts. But before we reached the grassy north, we had to battle through the parched south. We pulled into a small town in the middle of nowhere after trying a shortcut which resulted in some damage to the car. While refuelling and getting repairs done, we stopped for a coke and were mobbed by about a hundred local kids. We were told most of them had never seen a white man and they delighted in pinching the hair on our arms to make sure that we were real. The children were full of life and very clean considering the lack of water. But we pushed on hard north, driving from dawn till after dark, and managed to spend only a few nights in the desert, camping where and when we had to. After stopping in another nowhere town, Seedy decided to rattle off a few photographs. Unfortunately, he accidentally photographed mud huts surrounded by razor wire with a sign saying military installation on it. Before long, a jeep turned up on the scene and at first the boys in the back holding AK-47s were all smiles for the camera. Suddenly, however, the sergeant took exception to what we were doing and angrily demanded to see our film. Smiles suddenly turned to frowns, and we were facing four loaded AK-47s. At first, Seedy tried to argue with the sergeant, but as things escalated, changed his mind and handed over the camera. The ignorant sergeant then exposed the film to sunlight, then rolled it up and took our details, promising to return it once checked. This at least diffused the scary situation and the privates shouldered their weapons. Life is cheap in Africa and I truly feared for our lives for a few minutes. We couldn't get out of that town fast enough and it was good to get back on the road north. After a few more days of motoring through the desert, we finally started to see some green trees and increased amounts of scrub and water and life. Then one day I came round the corner and all of a sudden three elephants were wandering across the motorway blocking our way. For a few seconds I was too stunned to do anything as these massive animals ambled along. This was our first introduction to the Chobe area and stunned us all to see these great creatures wandering free in the open. Before long we reached the game park proper and were surprised to see how little infrastructure there was to the place. There were a few safari style places set up but other than that no real camps as such. We simply paid to enter and were free to set up camp anywhere we could. 
Upon entering the game park, we were blown away by the incredible amounts of life everywhere. Hundreds of species of birds, zebra and wildebeest in their countless thousands, antelope and gazelles, the huge impala and the impressive kudu with its corkscrew horns, all of them in massive numbers. Many other game like giraffes and hippos were also common along the river. But the most impressive of all was the vast numbers of elephants wandering freely. All of these animals in turn attracted huge numbers of predators like lions, cheetahs, leopard and hyenas. On our first day in the Chobe National Game Park, we met up with some hunters who told us they were culling elephants. The numbers were too great to sustain and they were devastating the bush habitat. They were culling whole family units at a time so as to cause as little disruption as possible. We found it hard to believe that such wholesale slaughter was necessary, though their explanation was compelling. On the river itself, we saw elephants to the red horizon. Nothing could have prepared us for that magnificent sight. As the sun slowly lowered red to the horizon, the elephants came down to bathe. Even the grumpy hippo were forced to give up the best parts of the river. The elephants truly revel joyously in this time. They play with their young, free in their great numbers from any predator. Instead, the lions lie hidden in the long grasses, watching patiently for an opportunity of easier prey. Life on the river runs like clockwork, and each animal that needs water has its turn. On our first day on the Chobe River, we caught the last half of the day. We found a flat patch of grass at around lunchtime. We were immediately robbed of biscuits by monkeys when we stopped for a feed. Dozens of baboons descended on the scene after the monkeys, and we quickly learned to leave nothing out for the robbers to have. The male baboons were particularly large and intimidating, with huge fangs and showing little fear of man. The best way to spot game was from the relative safety of the car. So after setting up our tents, we set off on the unsealed, sandy, bumpy roads. I was the designated driver by now, and the roads were sorely testing. I quickly learned the most dangerous time was driving through a family group of elephants. The young ones, ranging from one to two tons, would suddenly charge head first towards us. These mock charges were truly frightening and the only way to stop them is to plant boot and charge right back at them. The dust and the roar of the engine puts them off, but I had to be careful not to hit them as four-ton mum was always looking on. The large bull elephants, however, must be avoided at all costs. They are short-tempered, huge and run surprisingly quickly. We watched them bulldoze whole trees down and strip them of all of their leaves. The amount of devastation they caused was unbelievable. After spending the afternoon game spotting, we returned to camp to cook tea. As we cooked up what we had on the riverside camp, a family of warthogs came trotting past us and into their burrows in the riverbed. The water flowed quickly at this point, so there were no crocodiles about. All the same, I felt very vulnerable in our makeshift camp. I didn't sleep at all well, and at about 2am something came sniffing at my head. With only a millimetre of plastic between us, I was frozen with fear. The creature then moved off, and I fell into a whiskey-induced sleep. I woke up at the dawn chorus of birds and general wildlife. I poked my head out of the tent to watch our warthog neighbours trot past on their way out. 
The four of us headed out after breakfast. We spent all day driving around, game spotting, and before long Dave spotted a lioness in the long grass. I stopped and hopped out for a better look, but could not see her. I walked forward, but still I couldn't see her, until she blinked. By then it became suddenly obvious that she could run me down, so I backed up without unlocking eye contact. It was the first and last time I made that mistake in Africa. We had a great day game spotting, with loads of beautiful antelope to watch, along with any big cats that might be following. The middle of the day, however, was too hot for the cats, and the game was left to graze in freedom. Generally speaking, only the young and very old are the most vulnerable, as they are culled from the herd most often. We then headed back to camp for tea and sunset. A huge number of elephants came down to the river each sunset for a bathe and turned on a show. Our campsite was perfectly elevated for viewing up the river with binoculars. The sight of at least 120 animals in the lenses was something no wildlife centre or zoo could ever prepare us for. Slowly as I got more used to being surrounded by wildlife, the adventure became more enjoyable. We clicked into a routine of getting up at dawn and driving around game spotting each day. We soon learned the best spots near our camp, and no two days were ever quite the same. On one hot afternoon, we were watching a huge bull elephant bulldoze down trees. He had a particularly huge set of tr tusks and made for some great photographs. Suddenly Wayne decided he needed a good close-up and jumped out of the car and approached the huge beast. The elephant suddenly turned his attentions from the tree he was eating to Wayne. The bull stamped his foot and flared his great ears in warning, but Wayne remained oblivious, happily snapping off some great shots. The bull then trumpeted, stamped its huge foot, and it was all too late for Wayne as the bull began to charge. I'm out of here, I shouted to Wayne, and turned away, planting boot as I went. Wayne made a sudden sprint for the car, and managed to dive head first through the open passenger side window as I spun the wheel. As I roared off, my foot flat to the floor, all I could see was the huge elephant's head in the rear vision mirror. I could feel the ground shaking as he charged after us. Luckily I had just enough power to out-sprint the bull and slowly pull away from him, with Wayne hanging halfway out the window, far too close for comfort. After that incident, we made sure not to push our luck too much, as these animals were truly wild and had little fear of man. At one point, the road was blocked by a troop of baboons with one particularly belligerent male that parked himself in the middle of the road. I got out to shoo him away, only to come darting back in the car as he screamed and charged at me. We soon learned not to underestimate any of the wildlife about. Living conditions were the most basic at our makeshift camps. The river was unusable because of because of Bilahazia, a nasty waterborne parasite that destroys the liver and has no cure. We were also limited by our food stores, which we rationed carefully. Luckily enough, there were no more incidents at camp, so we were able to adapt to the routine of the river. Each morning our warthog neighbours would parade past at dawn as we made our breakfast. We spent each day trying to spot new species as well as our favourites. 
The giraffes were always fun to watch, as they looked so awkward, as they stooped, not need to drink. Although ungainly to look at, they made for great watching as they graze high up in the trees. Pretty much every species had some impressive attribute, from the grace of the antelope to the stealth of their predators, to the massive horned water buffalo, the ugly looking wildebeest, the beautiful zebra and all the other grazers. The most impressive of all, however, were the massive elephants with their huge tusks and trunks. To my mind at least, they were the kings of the jungle. Despite the hardships we had to endure, our time at Chobe was over all too soon. But I feel we left a little of ourselves there, and we took a little of that place with us. I look back on those days wistfully now, and I'm sure the three guys I travelled with feel the same. The end. Well, look at that. Doesn't 28 minutes fly by so fast? Thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed my little story today. And I hope you uh, give my ideas a little bit of consideration. I want to say thank you again to all the sponsors and Wirewrapper TV. Thank you all very much for helping make your community radio happen. And to you... I want to say please spread the good word. Michael and Veronica down here, thank you very much for your support, everything you've done for me, and uh, continue doing the good work. Thanks very much, and we will catch you again next week. Spread the good word. Thank you, and goodbye.